everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the uh, personal finance workshop today. Um, we're really excited to see you all here. And I think you're uh, in for a lot of really helpful information. I know today I'm going to be getting a lot of good tips <laughs> as well. Um, so uh, my name is Megan Spaulding. I am uh, from the Albers Placement Center. Uh, we are uh, hosting this workshop today. The Albers Placement Center is the career center for the business school. Um, so we serve undergrad and grad students in all things career planning. Um, and this spring we're doing, we're kind of focusing our programming and workshops around this theme of post-grad life. Um, all these events are open to all students, but for those of you who are graduating um, this spring or summer, and about to launch off into your next life transition. Uh, we have a lot of workshops this quarter focused on, uh, you know, things you might be encountering or wondering about or facing in the next couple of years and how can we support you around those topics. So this week, the theme is personal finance. Um, and we've got a great speaker for you today. Really grateful for Scott being here. So uh, Scott Severs is our presenter today, and Scott is a principal for um, Guard Capital. And um, let me just tell you a little bit of background about Scott. Um, Scott, as principal, wealth manager, and chief compliance officer, Scott acts as both architect and steward of the Guard Way. He was previously a senior portfolio manager at UBS Financial Services an equity analyst at Safeco Asset Management. And a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, he was a Boeing engineer. So those of you who are looking to transition, um, you know, one career to a totally different one, it is definitely doable, as <laughs> Scott has shown. Scott enjoys working personally and professionally with nonprofits in the Seattle area, as well as traveling and spending time with his wife and two kids. He's a Southwest native and he enjoys spending time running, cycling and swimming. Um, Scott is part of the Albers family. He did his MBA here and um, is still very heavily involved, thank thankfully. Um, he's been an Albers mentor in our Albers mentor program for us for 18 years. And he's also an adjunct faculty for the finance department. So Scott, thanks so much for being here. Really excited to hear all your wisdom today, and I'll turn it over to you. Awesome, thank you, Megan. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for um, thanks for doing this. I, I was remarking to Megan um, and Lori before everybody jumped on that um, I was a student there. I was in your shoes twenty two years ago, and uh, I, I know that we had some resources, but I think the depth and the level of of uh, resources and support that you can get now at Seattle U is is got to be so much better than it was when I was when I was going there. And I mean, I know there's lots of ways to get practical hands on experience and the teaching community is really good. So um, it's been a wonderful place for me to to stay affiliated with. And um, anyway, just happy to be able to talk about this topic. Uh, what we're going to try to do is cram this into one hour. I know some of you have places to be in an hour. And, and, you know, I've got a little more time if there's questions. Um, what I really like to do is introduce a few topics, take a pause, let you kind of fill in with some questions. We can use the chat. Um, probably too many people to have a free for all. Um, although we can, uh, we can see how that goes, but, but yeah, really um, the, the topic of today, and I'll share my screen here in a second is just some practical things that you can be thinking about at, at your stage of the game here. Um, these are things that maybe I, I wish I had someone tell me back when I was your age. And maybe I, I was kind of hoping, uh, or I would have hoped looking back that I didn't have to stumble across the answers on my own. That would have saved me a little time and put me a little ahead of the game. So this is gonna be just my opinion. These are not, um, absolute rules of thumb that everybody would necessarily subscribe to, but just sort of practically speaking from my experience, um, what are some things that were helpful to me? So that's kind of, that's kind of the, the platform here. Um, and, and as I, and if anybody wants to turn your cameras on, feel free. There's a certain someone I'm looking at right now, Sam Sook, who I happen to know. So I'm glad he turned his camera on. Hey, Sam. <laughs> All right, let me tell me if you can see this here. 
Yeah, looks good, Scott. Okay. All right. So, yeah, what we'll do is we'll launch into this a little bit. I'll take a pause. We can do some questions and see how it goes. So, yeah, these are six things I wish I knew but had to learn the hard way. And it could be like 25 things, but we only have an hour. And I figure six is probably good to cram into an hour's worth of time. So um, here's the list. Six things I wish I knew. Build good money habits. Um, key along with this concept of building habits is habits that you, routine, that you reproduce and get into the routine of can't be hard. They have to be easy. Okay, so that's something we'll talk about. Number two, make a simple budget. Know what money's coming in and know what money's going out and know what the difference is between those, okay? Number three, build your credit history right away. So when you go to borrow, when you go to borrow money because you wanna make a major purchase, um, you're going to need to have proven to somebody who's gonna lend you that money that you're credit worthy and that you'll pay that back. And so that's what building the credit history is all about. And you want to start that right away. Number four, set debt on a course for zero. So a lot of people ask, a lot of people just have a lot of questions about debt. Credit card debt comes up. How do I manage it? Happy to take some questions on that if you have it. Um, but that's a big deal, right? I mean, that's a, that's a big deal for people um, getting started out. Um, you, you, you borrow money, but you want to do it responsibly and how to make sure that you keep yourself in, a, in, in good standing with that is important. Number five, this is really key. Visualize retirement right now. So even if, I mean, if you're 22 years old or 18 or whatever, you know, whatever you are, it's kind of hard to envision when you want to retire, right? It's kind of hard to see 60. But in order to make it so that 60 is going to be a really good experience for you from then on, um, you have to think about it now. So I've got a little video I'm going to show you to that effect, and it's really cool. Um, and then number six is investing concepts. I'm going to say a little bit about that. Again, we could do a whole hour on investing. We could do probably 10 hours on investing. I know some people, have, some people are going to have questions about um, things that come up there. So we'll do the best we can with that. But um, in general, I'll give you a couple tips and tricks about that. Okay, so that's the plan. And uh, what we're going to do is let's launch in here and then I'll take a pause in a second. We can do questions. Okay, building good money habits. So I, I was trying to set this presentation up and I was going to have the thing where I ask the question and then I bring in the answer later, <laughs> but I couldn't quite figure out the tech on that. So here's the deal. Why don't New Year's resolutions work? Because they're too hard, right? So, so think about this. Think about the classic New Year's resolution. I'm going to the gym. I'm going to start a workout program, right? So what do people do? They sign up for the membership. They pay a bunch of money, right? And the buy-in is what sort of gets you going because you commit. Committing is important. But then what happens is you go into the gym and are, what are people doing when they go to the gym, right? Are they, are they in there for 15 or 20 minutes and then leaving? No, they're in there trying to do an hour or an hour and a half and they're gonna do this five days a week and they're gonna make a complete life transformation, right? Um, the reality of that is it's really hard and it's just not sustainable. You're just not gonna keep up that breakneck pace of change. Um, when in reality, what you probably should think about doing is 15, 20 minutes a day, maybe 30, something that fits really nicely into the routine isn't too hard to repeat over and over and over again. And that, um, that's a great example for a lot of these money habits that we want to build. They should be easy. They should be simple to fit into our normal routine. Okay. Um, examples of this. So. And again, we'll, we'll maybe get into a little more detail on some of these, but saving a little bit of every paycheck, right? Can you take a little bit of money once you get a job and every single month or twice a month, put a little bit in savings? You can do that without thinking. Companies these days make it really easy to do that. But it's that little bit of saving over a long period of time that can build into a nest egg, which can be really, really 
wonderful for retirement. Um, paying high interest credit cards first, not letting, we can talk about credit card debt, but in general, that's one tip, which is actually very easy to do if you think about it, directing the payment towards the one with the highest interest rate. Number three, keep track of your net worth. Okay, just know what it is. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, using a retirement calculator, there's lots and lots of tools available on the internet. I'll give you a couple here in a minute, but uh, a good habit to get into is just taking a look at one of these and seeing where you stand about once a year. All you have to do is once a year. You don't have to do it every week. Uh, simple thing to do. Another, th another simple thing that you can do, every time you're gonna make a big purchase and big is relative, so think about it relative to your own budget, take a pause. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but just take a pause and ask yourself, should I do this? Or how is doing this going to impact my overall budget? Right? That's a simple thing to do. And then um, lastly, and this is something you could do right now, and you should get in the habit of at least knowing where this list is, write down a list of your, your own personal financial goals. What is on your list to do to accomplish financially? Think about retirement, think about buying a house, think about buying a car, whatever it is, you know that if you write it down, it's much more likely to become a reality. So again, these are examples of habits, right? Any of these things can be implemented very easily. Um, you don't even have to think about them, okay? And on the topic of habits, if you're looking for a good read, The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg, I found this to be one of the best books I've read. And what it does is it tells you a little bit about the mind and how it works and why certain things stick and why other things don't. Okay, so that'll become an important concept as we think about repeatable behaviors. I'm gonna pause there. Let's see if we have any questions. So far, nothing in the chat, Scott. Yeah, I failed to mention everybody, sorry. Um, just as we go along, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat. Um, or also, if you want to raise your hand, we can unmute and um, have you ask your question on video as well. So whatever works best. Okay. All right, we'll keep moving. Chat away if you need. Okay. Let's back that up. Here's a question for you. So, so let's talk about a simple budget. Okay. Um, some of you have probably made a budget. Others probably have it, right? It's sort of one of those things where certain people are inclined to do it, others aren't. But ask yourself this question. Would you rather have a high net worth or a high cost lifestyle? If you want to exercise your fingers and, and you know, put your response into the chat, feel free. What, what sounds better to you, a high net worth or a high cost lifestyle? Okay, lots of high net worth people. <laughs> do you ever do you ever see? Yeah, this is kind of where I'm headed, right? Do you ever see a? Um, do you ever see a Lamborghini driving around town? And so sometimes when we see a Lamborghini, we look at it and we go, "That person must have a lot of money," or "That person must have a really high net worth," right? Um, that te that's the tendency, right? Um, all we really know is that that person's driving a very expensive car, okay? We don't really know anything about the rest of that person's financial situation, okay? It could be that that person's net worth is next to zero. Don't know, right? They could owe a whole bunch of money on that Lamborghini and a whole bunch of money in a bunch of other areas, right? So there's this kind of societal thing which says, hey, Leading a high cost lifestyle makes me look like I'm doing very well and I'm very successful, but that's not really what we wanna target. What we want is a high net worth, right? Net worth is assets minus liabilities. That's the equation, that equals net worth. Assets is what you have, liabilities is what you owe, and net worth is what you own, right? And when we have a high net worth, what happens is, we get to make a lot of our own decisions. That's, that's it. You know, when we have a high cost lifestyle, we've got to make sure we continue to do stuff to keep that up. But if we're doing this right, um, and you have a high net worth over time, and we'll I'll talk about how this works, 
um, you get to, you know, at some point work becomes optional. You get to decide what job you want. If you don't want to take that job because it doesn't pay enough or it, it's not as much fun as it should be, you get to say no, right? Um, that financial flexibility, happiness actually, I think, comes from financial flexibility, which comes from being able to make your own decisions, right? So one thing we want to do with a budget is to start, right? Budgeting is simply tracking where things are going. So think about how much you spend in a given month. Um, you've got a whole list of things where the money has to go. We want to be able to track to some extent uh, what that looks like. Okay, we want to have we want to have some knowledge of that. And so if you think about the equation of a budget, Revenue minus expenses equals net income. You've probably heard that in one of your finance classes. Um, net income is what's left over after subtracting expenses from what you make. So revenue is things like salary, any other forms of income that you get, uh, that's money coming in. Expenses is money going out. And there's a whole lot of those. There's usually only one form of revenue and that's, sal that's your paycheck, right? The money going out is your rent, pet care needs, insurance, anything else you can think of, the food, discretionary spending, all of that, okay? If you have enough net income left over at the end of the month on average, then you get to decide what to do with that. You could save that. You could use it to buy things, to accumulate assets. Um, and if you do enough of that over time, that's how we build net worth, right? And so we want to strive for a high net worth um, having a high cost lifestyle is fine as long as that whole equation is working out, right? But too many times, you know, we'll make a snap judgment and say, you know what, that person, that person's successful. They made it. And we may, we may know nothing about that financial situation, okay? Um, it's not to discourage you from going and getting nice things and buying what you want, but always remember in the context of this equation. Let me ask a question. You can chat me the answer. Where should savings go in this list? Is that part of revenue? Is it part of expenses? Um, when does it, you know, where in the, in the priority list of the budget does savings come in? Okay. All right. As you chat, a um, couple of thoughts. So a lot of people think about it as an expense, right? Which I guess is reasonable. Um, you, you know, you have to, it's like, you got to pay yourself, just like you got to pay the electric company, just like you got to pay the person who has a mortgage, who's your landlord, whatever. Um, what I would recommend is if you're bucketing it as an expense, pay yourself first. So you're the most important creditor, if you will, right? Everybody else needs to get paid, but you get paid first, meaning every single month, you're going to set aside a portion of money and you're going to pay yourself, okay? And then with, with whatever's left, you pay all the bills, right? That's a good framework. It doesn't work perfectly in every month, but that's a good framework. I actually like to think about it as part of revenue, though. So think about revenue is whatever income's left over after I've done the saving. So it's the net, it's all I have to do. It's, it's the only thing I have left to pay people with, right? So it, it comes right off the top. If you get a 401k plan at work, you will be in a situation where you can take savings right off the top. Before you ever get a paycheck, that savings will already be deducted. That's a wonderful way to go about doing this, okay? Um, that, that is, there's some comments on budgeting. Um, there are tools. So, so again, some people like a spreadsheet, you know, formulate the revenue, formulate the expenses, figure it out. Um, there's, there's tools. I'm just suggesting one here. You need a budget.com. There, there's a million of these. Mint is good. Quicken is good. Find one. Do it about, do, do it a couple of months in a row and see how that changes. I would say you probably need to track something like this for several months, maybe three months, and you'll get the feel for what the trends are. Okay. Questions, comments? Okay. Okay, to move on. Yeah, you're good, Scott. 
I think the only question was what tools you recommend. So. Okay. Yeah. And I would say, you know, again, that's one of them, but um, I, I budgets are generic enough. You'll find it just by Googling those. Yeah. I would question. say, go ahead. Is there such a thing as having too much in savings? Um, we can kind of cover that a little bit in the investing section, but in general, my answer would be no, except <laughs> if you have too much in savings, now you want to start asking the question, how is, what, what can that savings do for me? Right. And sometimes I find there's people who have a ton in savings, but it's all sitting in the bank. And so can we invest some of that and get a lot more growth out of it over time? And that's really the next question I would ask there. Scott, do you have a rule of thumb around how much though to have a way, you know, rainy day? I've always heard six months. Yeah. Worth the expenses if you rainy leave the job, you know, just what's your rule of thumb on that? You know, I don't have a great rule of thumb. I mean, that's very much a comfort zone kind of a thing. Um, but I think having three months, I mean, the, the rule of thumb gets back to if you lost your job, how many months would it take you to find another one and start getting paid again? And so that's sort of up to you and what type of work you have. And, you know, I think, I think three to six months is plenty. Maybe I would err on the side of a little less than that personally, but Partly what I, it depends on what you're doing with the rest of the money. So if you're investing the rest of the money, it's not as though all of that money can't be accessed necessarily. So just think to yourself, how much money can I get at that's not in cash and how easy would that be? Um, so I would say three months, three to six is fine. Yeah. Sam Sook says, sorry, Sam, picking on you. Are investments considered savings? I think they are. I think they are, but again, there is a wide spectrum of potential return opportunities depending on what type of investments you're talking about, right? And on the far left end is cash. On the far right end is the most volatile, risky investment there is, right? So, so it's in a spectrum. Um, real estate, Seattle real estate. Um, <laughs> that, that, that's one, that's a tough one. Um, a lot of times people are saying, hey, look, how can I go about, what's the best way to go about saving for, I want to buy a home, right? Um, I think the best framework is start saving now, do whatever you can. Don't lock yourself into a specific time frame. Like I, I mean, it's good to write down goals, but you know, with this market, the way it is, um, it, it may take a little longer to get to the point where you have enough saved up. I would think in terms of trying to get yourself to the point where you can put 20% down on a home, that would be good, at least 15%. Um, so that, that'll give you some framework, but you know, I will tell you it's tough out there and in Seattle, I mean, prices are growing faster than anywhere. Right. So, um, not an easy one, but the same saving principles can apply. Yeah. I'm going to keep it moving and, uh, just keep chatting and you can, Megan, let me know if there's more questions. So building your credit history. So you've probably heard of a FICO score. There are rating agencies, Experian, Equifax, and TransUnion, credit bureaus, that come up with a score. Your whole life can be boiled down to one number, right? When it comes to how good of a borrower you are. If you, they, what they do is they take a look at all your history and your, your pattern of paying back your debts. And if you've been very good and you've been doing this for a long enough time and you've shown the ability to manage things well, you'll get a score that's pretty high. And I would say if you're above 700 on this credit score, on the FICO score range here, most lenders will be happy to try to lend to you, right? You want to go borrow money to buy a car? They'll check your credit. It'll look pretty good. They'll say, great, here's the car. Here's the rate. If you're below that, you'll start getting into a scenario where they'll say, hey, we may lend to you, but your rates might be higher because we're not certain about your ability to pay us back. So we fight this battle throughout our whole lives about you know, convincing someone else that we're a, we're a worthy credit risk. And you want to do whatever is possible to keep your score as high as possible, okay? And there's some things that you can do to, to uh, well, let's talk about the formula. What goes into this? Well, again, here's just some uh, several insights. Paying your bills on time, keeping your credit utilization low, meaning that if you've got a credit card with, um, $20,000 potential balance on it, 
running it all the way up to 20,000 every month um, is probably not the best thing to do for your score, right? Partly it's good to use it, right? But, but they say, you know, don't, don't use all of your available credit. Make sure you've got some capacity. Um, applying for new credit. So if you go get three or four loans in one month, they'll look at that and say, well, you know, this person may have a tough time financing themselves. So why are they getting all these loans? Um, kind of managing that and not overdoing it on new loans, using different types of credit responsibly. So car loan, credit card, paying your bills on time, even utility bills. If you can manage to keep up on all of that, that shows a diversified credit history, which can be helpful for them. Um, they say, don't rush to close out old accounts, right? Because it is good to have credit available. So just because you're not using a credit card or you're not using a particular loan you got from the bank, you don't necessarily have to shut that down. But those are some types of things that um, go into this score. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you, whoops, sorry. I'll give you just some things I think about when I, when I think about tips here. Uh, you can go to one of these free, you can get your credit score anywhere now. You can go through your bank. You can go to freecreditreport.com. You can go to, you know, there's tons and tons of these places to get it. Um, you know, check the credit score. Right. Number one, know, know what it is as a starting point. Uh, number two, you, you, you're going to have to have at some point a credit card. So you want to start building this history as quickly as you can. If you don't have one now, seek out uh, a credit card company that will give you a credit card. It doesn't have to be a very high limit and just start using it. Right. Start getting in the habit of paying it off. If it's a low dollar amount, pay it off every month. OK, um, I tend to say. It's good to pay off credit cards every month, but you don't have to, right? You just have to keep extreme control over your credit. So more than the minimum, every credit card, by the way, has a minimum uh, monthly, fee, monthly payment. If you only paid the minimum, you would probably keep that balance around for 20 or 30 years, right? It's designed to keep you a customer and to keep you paying interest rates that you probably don't need to pay. So paying more than the minimum ensures that that balance is going gonna, is gonna to head south. Right. Um, again, careful about too many loans. I know sometimes it's really tempting when you go to the, you're going to go buy a piece of furniture and they say, hey, you can put it on credit. We'll open a loan for you. That generally doesn't help your credit score. Right. Because it's interest refinancing for a year. You'll see this a lot. So just be aware of that. One or two of those is fine. Having 10 or 15, not so good. 10 or 15 department store credit cards, probably not helping. Okay. Um, you can consolidate certain credit cards onto other credit cards. So you can turn two balances into one, hopefully at a lower rate. That's sometimes available to you. Um, and again, I think the last comment would be managing debt is very important and keeping out of trouble with credit cards is important. But um, in general, we want to do things in parallel. So we, we want to save and we want to manage debt. So try not to get yourself into a situation where paying the minimum payment is crowding out any kind of saving you can also do. Okay? You don't have to pay off the credit card totally. You can save and you can pay those down and invest at the same time. Um, those are my thoughts on, on credit. Questions? This is a big question one, Scott. <laughs> this is a hot topic. It is, I'm sure. Um, let me throw out some to you. Is there a way to increase it your score quickly like what would be the things yeah yeah that would really that really impact the most i think delinquency is want be yeah. on paying bills right is a big hit but yeah i mean if you have an overdue bill and sometimes you get caught and you don't even know it and yeah. next thing you know they, they wait a long time and then they send you to collections or something so sometimes the system can work against you um I, this is why you, you want to check the score a lot. Check your report, right? If you just go to the Experian directly to Equifax, Experian or TransUnion, I think that's the best way because not only are you getting a score, you're getting a report and it'll tell you what's late. So I would say on a quarterly basis, having a glance at this would be super helpful. But yeah, you want to pay off. You want to settle up on any issues very quickly that you discover, okay? And I really do think you want to... Um, you know, be very aware of the size of the credit card debt relative to your, say, overall financial budget, if you will, or your or your asset level, and uh, make sure that you're addressing those high interest cards. 
Um, those are those are two things that come to mind. I don't think there's any perfect um, answer here, but you're probably going to want to think about if you're having a trouble with the score, maybe maybe actually um, it might be because you have a lot of different accounts, each of which is running a balance pretty high relative to its capacity. So if you can consolidate some of that and really start focusing on paying that down for a few months. This is where if you do get a problem where the score drops, um, that would be maybe the one time when you might think about, all right, I have been saving. I'm going to channel some of this money that's been going into my investment account onto the credit card situation for, for a period of time. Those are a couple of thoughts. Um, is there a score you should be shooting for? Like what level is, you know, gets you access to most things? I think 700 and above is pretty good. I mean, I don't know if this particular table's dated. It's a few years old, but um, gosh, you know, if you're above 750, no one's going to say no to you for anything. Um, if you're above 700, you're in the game, I think, for, for most situations. So I would say 700 is a good target. Yeah. Another question. I don't know if there's any recommendation on managing DTI. I don't know what that is. DTI. Amy, do you want to put it in the... You could spell it out and we could figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to decode um, that first. Is there... Oh, yeah. That is like um, debt to income ratio. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, debt to income ratio. Boy. Um, it's funny because... Um, that ought to be relatively low when you're just dealing with credit cards, right? Uh, well, I, I, actually, I don't have a number in mind. I know what you're saying. So if you've got 20,000 of credit card out, uh, debt outstanding, um, you know, I just think it's going to be a little bit different for everybody, but, but everybody should have a firm command on what it's going to take to reduce that debt and, and have a, put it on course to go away, right? And that's different for everybody. So um, sorry, I don't have a bogey in mind for just that, but we're going to talk a little bit more about debt in the next slide. We can get into some ideas there. Yeah. What else? We got um, just for time, Scott, I'll just do this last question. Is there a time limit when you can apply for a new credit card from the time you got the previous, I guess, inquiries on your credit? <laughs> How much time should you let go by where there's hard inquiries? Uh, Between when them. you said hard inquiries, do you mean, um, now an inquiry could be just when you go get a car loan, they do an inquiry on your credit. Mm -hmm. Do you mean where you find an error? No, I think they mean like when you're applying and they're, you know, they're going to actually check your credit. You know, when they check your credit, I think that also impacts your score. Right. Like well, oh, I see what you're saying. You I see what you're saying. Yeah. Cause yeah. if I go get a car today and then tomorrow I go apply for a furniture loan and then I go <laughs> get a treadmill. Yeah. Right. I would say that can, that can impact your score. One way to tell though, is looking at your score. So it's not going to crush your score just because you got some inquiries. However, um, you might be able to see a trend between your score going down a little bit. In fact, these reports that you get, they'll tell you why it went down. So they'll let, you can get alerts that actually alert you and say, hey, your score dropped, here's why. So that can help you manage behavior. But I would say, again, in general, um, you know, if applying for cre new credit a couple times a year, okay, more than that, I would think that's probably counterproductive. Yeah, let's keep going. And if more credit questions come up, we'll get them answered. I'm sorry, I know we're not gonna get to everybody's here. Um, just being, being cognizant of time. Okay, let's let's talk a little bit more about debt in general. And I mean, we're, we're sort of continuing the credit card conversation. This is my statement. You don't have to pay them off every month. You need to be able to take control of the outcome, okay? This kind of gets to debt to income ratio. There's not a perfect number, but you have to have enough income and you have to be able to sort of forecast, if I make X payment more than the minimum, even if I'm not paying it off in full, is this gonna go down over time? And, and is this, and, and then you have to think, but what new spending am I putting on the card, right? It's a little bit of a math problem, but you have to know that when you take into account the new spending and the amount you're paying that, you know, the, the credit card balances are gonna keep going up forever, okay? And I know that's, that's a little bit wishy-washy, but um, once you have control over the path of your debt, you don't have to think about it anymore. 
part of if you uh, if you ask people, you know, those surveys they do where they say, uh, what are the different things that cause you stress in your life? Right. I mean, what do you think is number one every single time? It's something finance related. It's money. And so one of the things that causes people stress around money is debt. And so I just noticed that from talking to clients and friends, um, people are worried about debt. But if you can, like take a student loan as an example, a lot of people are worried about student loans. However, anything with a fixed rate of interest, you can calculate what's the amount of money that I need to pay to make it go away in 20 years or 15, 10. And as long as you know what that is and you're committed to not changing that, you don't ever have to look at it again. It's kind of nice. Unless I guess the rate is variable and it changes on you over time. But um, in general, having control over the debt situation, whether or not you have debt, um, is really freeing, is what I would say. Um, let me just give you my perspective on what I'll call good debt versus bad debt. This is me talking. I know that you go to a textbook, listen to somebody else, they might say it a little bit differently. Um, in my mind, good debt is related to things that appreciate over time. Bad debt is related to things that depreciate or where there is no nothing backing up that debt. Okay, and so here's what I mean. If you buy a house, um, if you buy a home, you get a mortgage. You borrow money you buy and, and to buy the house. So you end up only putting down 20% of your own money. You borrow 80%, right? But what happens to a home is in general, it goes up in value over time, okay? And you're paying at a fixed rate of interest, whatever that is, typically. So that means that the equity you have in that home is constantly growing. And that's a really good scenario, right? That's a very sustainable situation, assuming you can continue to afford the mortgage, right? And that is a problem for a lot of folks right now. So you have to be careful that you can afford it and that you're you're not assuming some massive raises in the future at work in order to afford the debt. Um, but that's, that's what, we, what I would call good debt. Um, investments, right? I don't advocate you borrowing a bunch of money to buy more stock necessarily, but, but stocks, a stock portfolio properly diversified is gonna go up in value over time and people use that to borrow money against. And if it's done at the right level, that can, that can be a nice place to potentially get money. I would say student loans are also good debt because the thing that's appreciating in value is you, right? You're making an investment in your future and your earning power when we go to school and we get a degree and we borrow money, right? So again, you don't wanna borrow so much money that you won't be able to pay it back because you won't be able to have the earnings power to do it. It has to be set at the right level, but I think that's good debt. Um, so good debt, the way I think of it is, it doesn't need to go to zero right away. If that makes sense. Bad debt also doesn't necessarily need to go to zero right away, but it needs to be paid attention to very closely. Credit card debt is the key for, I think, folks in your situation. Um, making sure you know how to get it to zero if you had to. Okay. Um, other loans like car, car is a tricky thing. What happens to a car the moment you drive it off the lot? That's the first time I heard the word depreciation was in, in reference to that. So it loses value. Every single day, it loses value. And you have a loan at a fixed rate of interest you're trying to pay off, right? So um, that's, a, that's a tricky situation. We always, we want to make sure we're, we're, that's why you don't see a car loan for 30 years. <laughs> car loans are for five years or less, typically, right? The less, the better. So um, anyway, there's different types of loans. I would just say, just because you have debt doesn't mean it's panic time. There are some structured ways to manage it. And so again, you know, if there's follow-up questions after this, I'm happy to chat with you about that. Ideas for paying down debt. Um, there's a couple ways. There's a, a different schools of thought on this. Paying off low balance cards right away. Let's say you got three cards and you've got a balance on each. Um, sometimes it's just good to get unstuck and get something accomplished. And sometimes taking that lowest balance card and paying it off. So now you're down to two. That can be a huge benefit for the psyche and it can help you get going. Um, paying off, another one is the math, the math of paying off higher interest cards first, right? If you've got a card that's charging to 20% interest and you've got the opportunity, and then you've got other debt at 10% or 12, 
um, or if you have the opportunity to do a balance transfer and consolidate onto a lower interest card, you should consider that. And there may be some rules around that. I'm not totally up on the, the latest, but I don't know how many consolidations you can do in one year or, or what, but I mean, consider those 20% interest cards are really not productive for your financial situation over time. Okay, so those need to, those need to work their way to the high end of the priority list for you. Um, and then, you know, this bottom one's kind of obvious, but it's like uh, one way to manage debt is to stop adding to the debt. So, <laughs> you know, we, we, this day and age, it's so easy to get stuff and accumulate stuff that it gets to be a routine. Like it's, it's one of those habits we talked about that's not a good one, but and it's really easy to foster that habit. So when you have a big purchase, take a pause. Um, impulse buys when you have credit card problems are not a good thing. So, and again, there are counseling services for this. There are people you can talk to. There are people that specialize in just this. So I would just say, if you feel like you're having an issue with that, um, you know, ask Megan, maybe we can talk offline. I, I don't, I can help you come up with some, you know, some people that might help and have some really specific guidance on that. But yeah, just be careful with that and, and try as best you can to take control over that path. What do we have in the chat? Anything else? Nope, you're good. Okay. Somebody asked about backup withholding. I thought that was an interesting question. You know what, backup withholding, usually I hear about it in the sense of an investment account where um, you incur taxes as part of having an investment account. And if you don't, if you have a mismatch between the, um, if you have a mismatch of say an address or a social security number, then it means that the stuff that happens in that account can't be properly reported to the IRS. If there's a mismatch, a lot of times the firm that's holding your money will start withholding tax for everything you do, any sale of a stock or something. And that's backup withholding. And that can be avoided by usually, you know, making sure just the right, that the account is set up properly. That's, that's my experience with it. So it's, it's the IRS, it's the government's way of getting paid when they are not sure they're gonna get paid. Okay, uh, moving on here. Okay, visualize retirement now. I'm just trying to be aware of time. Let's watch this short video. By the way, this is my favorite quote of all time. Plan for your future because that's where you're going to be spending the rest of your life. <laughs> okay, do we have time for a video, four minutes? Let's, let's check this out. Yeah, I think we're good. Go. Tell me if you can't hear this when I turn it on. Compound interest is what we're talking about. It's a mathematical explosion. Einstein said that compound interest is the eighth wonder of the world. Now, compound interest is simply this. You take your money down to the bank. Let's take this $1,000, and we take it down to the bank, and we put the money in the bank. Now, you leave it there, and it earns interest, and you leave the interest there. The next year, you earn interest on the $1,000 and on the interest. The next year you earn interest on the $1,000 on the interest and on the interest, and you leave it there again. The next year, you earn interest on the $1,000 on the interest, on the interest, on the interest, and then you leave it there again. That's what compound interest is. The trick with investing is you got to start, and you got to start right now. You got to get started. So we're going to get the $1,000 out of the way. We're going to get the emergency fund built as quickly as we can. We're going to get you out of debt, and then we're going to get you investing as fast as we can in these baby steps because time needs to be on your side. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's look at Ben and Arthur for a minute. Ben starts saving money at 19 years old. He saves $2,000 a year. He does that all the way up until age 26. At age 27, you will notice Ben puts in zero. Say zero. zero. At 27, he quits putting money in, but he's got the, he's got the pump primed the snowball is there. It's starting to roll down the hill. And every time it rolls over, it picks up more snow because it's a bigger ball each time it rolls over. Then his brother, Arthur, on the other side, he looks up and says, ooh, ooh, Ben's saving money. I need to save money. He starts saving money at age 27. Now, let's fast forward all the way to the end of the story at age 65 and see what happens. What happens is, at the end of the story, Ben has put in $16,000 and has ended up with $2,200,000. Arthur 
who put in $78,000 only ends up with $1,500,000. The guy who put in $78,000 later ends up with $700,000 less than the guy who put in $16,000 earlier. Some of you are looking at that and going, that's a real nice chart if I was 19. <laughs> well, let me tell you this. If you're in here and you're under 25 years old and you grasp what I just showed you intellectually to the point that it drops from your brain into your heart and changes your behaviors, I just made you a multimillionaire. You shouldn't be allowed to graduate from college or high school without being able to explain that chart. It would change America if people understood that chart. I'm going I'm to stop it there. Let's go back to our slides. So um, that was Dave Ramsey. Everybody hear that okay? Yeah. That's probably the best four minutes and 28 seconds you could spend thinking about your retirement. <laughs> but Dave Ramsey, um, he's a radio personality, he's, you know, tours around talking about financial matters. Um, you know, that one video I've been, I've been showing over and over again for years because it's really quite simple, but the key is actually the, there's no real magic around winding up with a nice nest egg in retirement, except that you have to start right now. And I like the way that he said, uh, if you understand what, if you understand this concept and you put it into practice, meaning like put it into a habit that's repeatable now early on, I just made you a multimillionaire and who wouldn't want to be a multimillionaire. <laughs> so, um, I love that concept, retirement savings. So what you wanna do is visualizing retirement. You wanna start thinking about this right away. And you wanna actually ask yourself a couple of questions. Um, and, and even if you don't think the answer is necessarily right, you want to get into the mindset. When do you wanna retire? Just write it down. How much do you think it's going to take you to live on in retirement? What does that budget look like, right? So if you have a budget now that you've created and you're like, okay, I get it. This is pretty reasonable for me now. You can start to assume some things about costs in the future. Again, not perfect. And, uh, and then you can say, all right, well, look, in retirement, I think it's gonna take me X, okay? Uh, what other goals do you have? So we already talked about writing down goals. You wanna buy a house, you wanna buy a car, whatever. You wanna buy the Lamborghini, put it, put it down on paper. Uh, then you want to say to yourself, well, gee, you know, then somebody asked about Seattle real estate. Ask yourself this, am I willing to move somewhere else? Because there's always a trade-off, right? There's always some other city where housing costs are cheaper and I can afford to have more stuff or I can afford to save more, right? And that's just the balancing act that we all have to do. Um, and then, you know, again, you can look at your budget and you can start to do things like, hey, you know, that that line item there that's been kind of running away on me the last couple of months, I might actually be able to cut that down. Maybe I don't even need that, right? Sometimes we just get, again, back to habits. We get into the habit of doing things because it's what we do. You don't have to live like that, right? So I would say you want to start thinking about what retirement looks like now as best you can. And then the trick with retirement planning is every year, just do the same thing again, and you will have new information and it will update. It'll be this living, breathing thing. So ideally then, if you've got some, some framework around it, you can go out and you can find these retirement planning tools. And uh, I did a fun thing with a couple of students a few years ago that were interning with me. Um, actually in my class, which is Finance 5345, Personal Financial Planning, which I, I teach generally in the winter, uh, the winter quarter. Um, we did an exercise where we went out and, and I have the students go and discover, you know, look, look at all these financial planning tools, find the ones you like, tell me about them. We'll do, and then we do, and we do a sample. Um, we're actually doing our own plan and we put the numbers in. So here's two that came back as, um, uh, ones that people like, and they're easy to use smart asset and bank rate. And there's a ton more than that, but what you want to do is, um, find something that will project forward how much money you're going to have in retirement. And, and you want to just run that analysis once a year, right? It's not critical to, you know, you, you don't need to panic about it. You don't need to revisit it every week. You don't need to check your balances all the time. But just kind of knowing generally where the roadmap is pointed is, is fantastic for this.
Okay, so that's my comment on retirement planning. Questions there? Again, these are things I wish someone told me. And, and I'll, I'll offer this too. Um, I occasionally have the opportunity to meet with folks who are, let's say 55, and they will say to me, I mean, and I hear this so often, they say, Scott, I'm getting started saving with retirement. I wish I had done this sooner, right? I, 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 I wasted this or that, and I, I didn't think about it. And now I really have to make up some ground, right? I, I hear that a lot. So you can avoid that by just doing some simple things now. And, and a little bit over a long period of time is really the magic of investing and saving. I'll pause. Okay. So this is a chart I wanted you to, to, to know. This is kind of one of those Dave Ramsey-ish things um, where if you, if you get this, it, it makes it so much easier. The S&P 500, you might've heard of it. It is, think of it as the largest 500 companies in the United States trading on the stock market. So it's a proxy for how the US stock market is doing. So when you, when you hear in the headlines, stocks are up today. Um, very likely you could look at the S&P 500 and it was up today, right? We're saying, you know, the, the group of US stocks is up today. So you can invest in the S&P 500. You can buy a fund that basically gives you the performance of the entire stock market. And if you did that, and if you've done that over time, you've done extremely well if you've given it, if you've given it enough time. And so you might've heard markets do really well over time and yeah, they're volatile, but over time you make a lot of money. Well, here's some numbers around that. If you took $1,000 and you invested in 1970 in the S&P 500 itself, and you just let it sit there. So it would, and it, you let it sit there for 45 years. And so it would grow and grow and the stocks within it would increase in value. And so you'd get that and then they pay dividends. So you get some cash flow. So the sum total of all of that value, you would have turned a thousand into $89,678, right? But here's the kicker. If you were not in the market for the best five days, in that entire 45 year period, you would have only wound up with 58,214. This is a big difference. <laughs> and, and reasons why people aren't in the market is they get scared and they, and they sell their stocks and they go to cash, right? This is very common. And it's because we don't understand it well enough to know. They think that you know the people who are smart and make a lot of money in markets do so by knowing when to get in and out. When reality is, uh, the people that do best in the market simply stay in. And that's the dirty little secret of investing. Um, notice too that on the far right side, if you decided, look, I, I wanna save, I'm a great saver, but I don't want to put my money at risk in the market, you turned 1,000 into $9,195 over 45 years. Not Probably not enough to accomplish the kind of goals that, that you're after in retirement, okay? So I just wanna give you that perspective. Um, and again, we don't have time to go into all the nuances of investing, but when you invest, um, and let's go to the next page. Scott, two can things I ask a, to think. Go can ahead. I ask, sorry, can I ask a question around retirement? Um, if students have the means and want to start now, even $50 a month or whatever it is, uh, and they don't have a 401k yet, or for the, what's your recommendation? How do you start that? Yeah. Well, thanks for bringing that up because I am a huge fan of doing a little bit right now. Yeah, I don't want people having the mindset of, hey, I'll wait until I get that raise and then I'll do more because it's hard to change habits. So um, my ex the, the best place to start a savings program is in your company retirement plan. So presumably you're working. Not all companies have a retirement plan. Um, if you don't have a retirement plan at work, you can open what's called an IRA or a Roth IRA. And again, a little bit of in the weeds as far as the differences there, which I'm happy to take a question if we have time. But, but in general, they have some limitations on dollars, but you can put up to $6,000 into one of those vehicles each year. So if you were doing 50 bucks a month, there you go, right? Um, is, doing a little bit now is great because, because the way investments can grow over time, that can turn into a lot. But what happens in the mind is that you do a little bit 
and then it grows and you do a little bit more. And then all of a sudden you look five years later and you've got this really nice nest egg. And so what do you think you want to do when you see a little money turned into more money? You want to save more money. <laughs> so you will over time be, it'll naturally work its way up the priority list in your budget, right? That's what I see happen. So that is that answering your question? Yeah, that's great, Scott. It's Megan, it's me. The other thing I, that I thought was cool when I, I opened a Roth after college, but you can also use it towards, can't you use it towards other big expenses if you need to, like college savings. And I think there's like five things you're allowed to do to pull it out early. Yeah, so it, that's right. So, so let's talk about an IRA, not a Roth. An IRA is something where you put money in and then you get a tax deduction for that. So it's a pre-tax situation. So in other words, when you pull the money out, you have to pay tax. However, if you're below 59 and a half years old, you also have to pay a 10% penalty. So the incentive structure is keep it in for your retirement, right? However, there are a couple extenuating circumstances like first home, college, and, and several others where you can avoid the 10% penalty, but you still have to pay the tax. Okay. The Roth is different in that you're paying after tax dollars and you don't get a deduction. And then that grows, everything grows tax free in there. So this is great for young people with a long time to go here. Um, the trick with the Roth is you just have to have it for five years. And then that 59 and a half rule also applies. So if you, if you have it for five years and you're 59 and a half and you pull money out, there's no tax at all. If you, um, I guess if it meets one of those extenuating circumstances and it's been in there five years, there's no tax on that. So I think that might be where you're headed. But there's other vehicles too. You can open up a brokerage account. That money's always accessible to you. You can invest in whatever you want. Um, let, let me give you some quick tips on investing. And then that's, that's kind of it. And then we can pause and do as many questions as, as we have left. Okay. Here are my simple tips in no certain order. If it's too complex for you to explain to your grandmother, don't do it. <laughs> This is what I, I've, I've learned. I keep learning this when I talk to people or, or you know, over time. Um, making money over time and doing really well has nothing to do with complexity. In fact, the simpler, the better. That's me. Other people might need complexity. I have just found that's not the case. 12% per year is not a realistic return expectation. So when you think about, when you go, when you go to smart asset and you use that retirement calculator, don't plug in 12, right? 12, there might be some years when you get 12, there might be some 10 year periods when we've had 12, but I would say six to seven is a much better number to use. You wanna be somewhat conservative. Um, you know, we're worried about the downside risk, right? Um, okay, investing in general, can it should be fun, right? So you're probably at the point where you're thinking there are some interesting stocks out there, you're probably thinking about crypto, you're thinking about Amazon stock, all kinds of interesting things that, that people seem to be using to make money. I would say the best thing you can do for yourself to learn is to start investing at a reasonable level, to, you know, assuming you've got the cash discretionary savings to do it. Um, so you want to invest in some Microsoft and learn about that and watch the volatility of that and see it grow over time, hopefully. But the reality is that you need diversification. Okay, and at the top of this page, I didn't really say it. Diversification and managing your costs are the two best things you can do. You don't need to worry about much else. Okay, you need 75 to 80 percent of your of your money that you have over time to be invested in something like the S and P 500, maybe some bonds as well. Different types of assets that really protect you, that 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 spread the risk out, not just one company or even a portfolio of five stocks can be extremely volatile and hard to predict over time, okay? Doesn't mean you shouldn't have fun, just needs to be kind of right-sized in your, in your portfolio. Um, yeah, I already said that one. Yeah, so fun with individual stocks, that's not a retirement saving strategy. Uh, fees, so when we invest in funds, um, Funds are, are meant to give us diversification kind of instantaneously. We can buy one vehicle and it can give us exposure to 500 companies. That has a management cost associated with it. Okay. Also hiring an advisor has a cost associated with it. So I would say as a target, it's okay to pay fees, but 
Think about the combination of advisory fees you might be paying to a person over time as you accumulate wealth. Add that to the cost of the funds you're using. I would say keep it below 1%. That's just a bogey. And that's a, that's a good thing to think about. Okay. Um, I was as a suggestion, uh, and just as long as we're talking about the S&P 500, here's an example of a Vanguard fund. It's called the Total Stock Market ETF. It's called an exchange traded fund. Some of you may be familiar with this. This costs, this gets us exposure to the entire US stock market, right? One shot, you've got $1,000. You wanna buy the entire US market, you can buy VTI. For 0.03% per year, you can own it. It's practically free. <laughs> they make money because they have a lot of assets in this fund, right? You, the average re expense ratio of similar funds, 0.8%. You can get a spreadsheet out and do the math on the difference of 0.77% every year for the rest of your life. It will make a massive difference in the amount of money you have left at retirement, right? So keep the costs low. Um, use exchange traded funds, index funds. Those are great. Um, that's my commercial on that. And then one last comment. Uh, I like to recommend books because I feel like sometimes, you know, I might do a lot of talking, but it's still just my opinion and my take on this stuff. Listen to a lot of podcasts, talk to people, talk to your parents, talk to friends that invest. I have found there's one book in particular that I really, really like. I give it out a lot. It's called The Investment Answer. It's a short book. It's literally this thick and you can read it on a plane flight. Uh, it, to me, captures exactly what you need to know about the basics, five or six things that you can just be constantly aware of, habit-forming things. Um, I think it fits right in line with what we're talking about here. So let me, uh, let me stop there. There's probably some questions. Thanks, Scott. This is so great. I know people might have to go off to class or um, their next things, but uh, if there's a last, you know, a few Final questions. I think we have a couple more minutes. Yeah, Naomi, go ahead. So um, I have a question regarding the earlier question on backup withholdings. Like, um, so it was a requirement for me to check whether I was subject to it, like before opening a new savings account. And I was wondering how can I check this? Like where? Huh. You know, that's a great question. I'd have to, you know what I'd probably do in that case? I'd have to Google that. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's not a great scientific answer, but um, backup withholding in my experience, usually um, the reasons why it happens are usually held at the custodian where the money is. So at the bank or at say Charles Schwab is a good example. You, you know, if they're, not, if they're not able to tell you why, um, you might have to do a little research and sort of figure out, maybe you can get a report or you can, I, I, then the next thought I have is the IRS and how can, but I'm just thinking it's hard to get a hold of somebody at the IRS, but what you might be able to do is, you know, irs.gov has just like, you know, so much content. You might be able to go to the site and just search on backup withholding and see what it says. Gotcha. There's a form that you can fill out to fix it too. And I can't remember the name of the form, but again, the irs.gov website's pretty good. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions before we wrap up? I'm, Scott, I'm impressed. You covered a lot of topics in an hour. <laughs> I felt like it was a little bit rambly there at the end. I think great. we're cramming too much into an hour, but I, it, yeah. it's, it's, you know, things to think about and I'll send you the, the slides so you have them. That's great. And if you're a grad student, like Scott mentioned, he teaches this, you, get a, you would get a whole quarter of all this great advice and information uh, you teach next winter, right? Scott? Yeah, we'll start again in January. Right. So yeah, I'd love to see you there if, if that's class. something that's of interest to you. I tr the, the other thing you should know about the class is I try to teach it so that people get a good sense for what we do, like here at Guard Capital. Mm -hmm. So what does a wealth manager do? That's that's kind of the flavor. In fact, I hired, I hired a Seattle U uh, student uh, last year <laughs> who was in my class. <laughs> So it's a good networking not, opportunity. not that I'm offering jobs to everybody necessarily, <laughs> but that, that did happen. That's cool. Cool.
Great. Well, if no other questions, I think we'll wrap up. Thank you. Oh, let's see. Will it be offered online or in person, Scott, the class? You know what? Um, I, um, hi, oh, Anoop is, Anoop was in my class. Uh, hi, Anoop. <laughs> I don't know if there he is. Um, you know, we did it all online uh, and I thought it was okay. I think it would probably be a hybrid. I think I'd probably do some recording of lectures and then use the class time for, it, it'll be, it'll be in person, but it would be sort of a hybrid model, I think. Yeah. yeah. Great. I realize well, okay. not everybody wants to hear me lecture for three hours straight. <laughs> it's just not that fun. Cammie, did you have a final question? Oh, yes. I'm not a finance like graduate student. So do you, do you have other events on open? Because I really like you bring up all of the ideas. <laughs> Uh, say that one more time. Is there are there other events that are going to happen? Yes, because I'm not a graduate finance major student, so yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think the class is only open to the grad students, but um, yeah, I mean, to the extent there's other opportunities to share this kind of content, you know, I'm always open to it. So I might. Maybe I might, we could give the uh, advice to the finance department. We need to do it at the undergrad level as well as an elective. <laughs> Yeah. It's possible. Um, Thank you. It's really one of my, one of my kind of missions is to kind of make sure that when people come out of school, mm -hmm. they don't have to wait five years down the road of making a bunch of mistakes before they just have some really easy things to think about to set them, set them on the right path. You know, I mean, and, and I've been struggling with how to, how, how I would do this on any kind of grand scale. I can't really do much, but one at a time, but I think it's really important. I agree. Yeah. Well, thanks, Scott. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. I hope it was helpful for you. Um, our next event, coming up events in the post-grad life series, which again, everything's open to everybody. Next Tuesday at this time at 1230, we'll be talking about salary negotiations. Great. So if you're in the job market and looking for jobs and thinking about how that process works, please join us next week on Zoom. And then also um, we've got mock interviews coming up with employers on the 27th. I think we have some spots open at the undergrad level. So again, if you'd like to kind of practice your interviewing skills. And then grad students, um, next Thursday, uh, April 21st, is that next Thursday? Yeah, um, we're doing a, a big networking event for grad students in person. So. Uh, if you're wanting to meet some employers and mentors and alumni, we'll be doing over that over at Casey Commons at 4.30 um, for Albers grad students. So uh, looking forward to an in-person event as well. So yeah, Lori just put the info in the chat. Thanks, Lori. So again, the Placement Center is here to help you with all things career planning. So feel free to make an appointment. Scott, thanks so much for your time today and great tips and information. This has also been recorded and we'll put it up on our YouTube playlist, which you can get to from our website. So thanks everybody and hope you have a great rest of the day. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Megan. Thanks, Scott.